Heavenly Father, we come to you today with full gratitude in our heart for, first of all, just who you are. God, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you for being a loving Father. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to demonstrate your love for us while we were still sinners. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit who convicts us, who draws us to you, who keeps us instructed in your ways. And so, Father, today we thank you that through the power of your Holy Spirit, as you, as you teach us today, as you convict us today of sin and unrighteousness, I pray that you will give us a grateful heart I pray that you'll help us to truly understand and fully experience the power of your mercy, the power of your grace, as we continue to worship you now and celebrate you in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to open your Bible and keep it open as we continue this morning in our worship, uh, walking through Psalm 106, 106. Over the past years, I have had the privilege to fulfill my civic duty by serving on a number of jury panels uh, in our judicial system here in our country. I've served on many city court panels. I've served on the county court panel. I've served on the federal court level at Florence and also the federal level in, in Columbia. Uh, I've just been one of those lucky ones who've been chosen to serve our country and serve our uh, judicial system by being on these jury panels. I remember one jury panel I served on in Conway. Uh, this lady was, first of all, she had divorced her husband so she could sue him for reckless driving. And he was suing another man for running and crashing into him. And the other man was suing him for crashing into him. And so we had three sets of, uh, of attorneys there in the courtroom at the same time. And I was the lucky one to be chosen as the foreman for that, for that jury. Uh, we have uh, experienced some crazy things in our court systems recently. Uh, you may be aware and intrigued like me of some court cases that are going on in our area, in our state right now. Uh, and observing some of the evidence in some of these trials would help you to believe that, that anyone who was logical would just admit that they were guilty and plead guilty. But I'm sure you're aware with me that one of the hardest things in the world for us to do is say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I don't know, there's just something about our human nature. Psychologists tell us that when we're put on the spot, it's so easy for us to fight back or run away or, you know, blame somebody else for what we've done wrong. Again, one of the hardest things for us to say is, I'm sorry, I was wrong. We spent the last month and a half looking at Psalm 104, 105, and 106. These are companion psalms, and they take us through a lot of history. In fact, all of the history of, of Israel, all of the history of the Old Testament. In Psalm 104, we learn that God was the perfect creator of everything in our world and everything outside of our world. Before the beginning of time, God existed. He exists today. He always will exist. He is the perfect creating God. However, we learn that in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve fell into temptation and they distorted God's perfect creation plan. When tempted, did they admit their sin? No. They covered up. I mean, Adam blamed God. He said, God, the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit, and I ate it. And then what did Eve do? In Genesis chapter 3, Eve said, that serpent tempted me, and I blame that serpent for causing me to, to sin. Again, the hardest thing in the world for a human being to do is just simply say, I messed up. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. So since that original sin, uh, we've all been corrupted 
by living in a sinful world. And we all have been corrupted by a sinful nature. You and I are born. Every person is born into the world since Genesis 3 with a sinful nature. And what does sin do? Well, sin separates us from God. And that's why repentance is essential to you and I coming to understand what what life is really all about, to understand our purpose in life, to understand how we can really have joy in life. Then in Psalm 105, we, we saw the last two weeks where God created a rescue plan. He created a plan to rewire us and put us back to, together to recreate, to rewire us into a new creation, into a new person. And this perfect plan to rewire and restore us set the stage for our salvation, set up by leaders like Abraham and Joseph and Moses and God's chosen people Israel. We see that story unpacked and unfolded in Psalm 105. God became one of us. He became flesh. Jesus, God's perfect Holy Son became one of us to sacrifice His life and pay the price for the penalty of our sin and make it possible for us to be rewired and restored to God. So we have a Savior. We have a perfect rewiring plan. And rewiring begins by genuine repentance. And today and next Sunday, we're going to be looking at Thanksgiving through the lens of Psalm 106, through the lens of being able to honestly, with integrity, and with the truest meaning of our humble, broken heart for our sin and the sin of our people to say, God, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? So Psalm 106 begins by giving thanks to the Lord for He is good. And thanksgiving begins with repentance. So Lord willing, next week we're going we're to dig deep into thanksgiving and we'll look at the result of repentance. But for today, I want us to look at how to repent. Again, you might ask, you know, why do I need to repent? I'm not, I'm not a bad person. I have never killed anybody. I have never stolen anything from anybody. I'm not such a bad person. Well, like our lives today, the psalmist was filled with sadness. He found himself isolated from his homeland, in bondage, in Babylon, for 60 or 70 years, he had been struggling with being away from home and not being able to get back to home. I sense that that's the problem with many people maybe sitting here today where we have been isolated from God. We have been in captivity to sin, away from God. And we want to get back home. The saddest thing in the world is to be separated from God. Let me say that again. Lots of sadness in the world today. But the saddest thing in the world is to be separated from God. My sin separates me from God. Your sin separates you from God. And so confessing our rebellion against God is the beginning of repentance. It's the first step back to God. And I believe that's the most important step during this Thanksgiving holiday season you can make and I can make today. Out of sadness, <laughs> we can find our greatest hope. When I repent of my sin, I return to God and the world takes on a totally different perspective. I sat with a friend this week. 
who shared some really sad news with me. And it did two things. When he shared that sad news with me, it did two things. First of all, it took me down that road to some things that broke my heart, that made me sad. And secondly, it reminded me that my only hope is in Jesus. And I trust and pray as we work through this psalm this week and next week that the confessions of the psalmist will do those two things for you. I pray that the confessions of this psalmist will take you down a road in your life where you have wickedness, where you may have turned your back on God. And then secondly, where it will remind you that your only hope and my only hope is in Jesus and we turn to him for repentance. So let's dig into it. How do we repent? First of all, Psalm 106 verse 6 reminds us that we remember our sin. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time today. So if you're taking notes, remembering our sin is where most of our time is going to be spent today. In verse 6, the psalmist says, both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. And so true repentance, true confession is specific. Look at what the psalmist says. He calls rebellion sin. He says, both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. When the psalmist says, both we and our fathers have sinned, he demonstrates that his heart is a confessional heart. And if you want to have a vibrant relationship with God today that's rewired and reconnected directly to Him, that's where you have to start. You have to start by saying, God, I'm sorry. God, I've messed up. Not only have my father sinned, I mean, our country's, what, 250 or so years? Oh, we can go back through the history of our country, and we can find probably more iniquity in our history than, than the psalmist found in his history. So don't let that pass this morning without going there and demonstrating along with the psalmist a heartfelt confession. Repentance is more than just saying, I'm sorry, but it starts there. Confessing rebellion, look at it, and iniquity and wickedness exposed his heart that felt separated from God. Are you there today? Are you at a point where you want to get closer to God than you've ever been before? Psalm 51 verse 17, the Bible says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. God's arms are open wide for us today to run back to Him. And the first step to making that happen is to have a broken, contrite heart that truly expresses the sorrow for my sin and you expressing the sorrow for your sin. So when's the last time you really got serious about confessing sin? Steps four, five, and six in addiction recovery processes require sinners to first of all make a fearless and moral inventory of ourselves. Secondly, admit the exact nature of our wrongs. And then thirdly, ask God and ask others to forgive us. That's biblical. That's what the psalmist is pointing us to today. So in verses 7 through 46, the psalmist goes on an 800-year confession. <laughs> and he gives specific examples of heartfelt confession. Now, I've taken this long psalm. And for us today, I hope you'll spend some time going back through it as you work through your Thanksgiving time this week. But I've condensed these verses in this psalm into seven categories. Seven categories that express an attitude of repentance, an attitude of confession before the Lord. First of all, category number one is ingratitude. We see that in verses 7 through 13. 
where he says, Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember, circle that phrase, they did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry. He led them through the deep as through a desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foe and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. And the waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words and sang his praise. So from a memory of simple history, the psalmist saw where God had saved and delivered Israel and yet, they were still not grateful. They did not remember what the Lord had done. How could somebody forget something that just extremely, you know, attractive? I mean, remembering that God rolled back the sea and they walked across on dry ground. And then before that, God had inflicted ten plagues on Egypt in order to demonstrate His desire and power to set them free and restore them to the promised land, and yet they did not remember. They quickly forgot. They resisted God. It's sad that somehow humans are forgetful people. You remember God delivering you from the penalty of your sin. Have you come to that place in your life where you know you have been forgiven? Remember that. Don't forget what God has done. The, the psalmist remember that God is a covenant-keeping God. He's a redeeming God. In other words, He's doing everything He can to love you to Himself, just like He did Israel. For a moment, they sang His praises. Do you remember the time after you first gave your life to Jesus? And there was a song in your heart of rejoicing about God setting you free from the penalty of your sin? Don't forget that. Continue to sing praises to God. I wish that was the continuing story of Israel. But unfortunately, verse 13 is there. They soon forgot His works. They did not wait for His counsel. They forgot about God. Are you aware that that is the epitome of ingratitude? Forgetting what God has done for you. I mean, just the, the little things the, that are not really little things. The breath of air that we have. The, the, the health that we have to be able to enjoy all of God's creation. Psalm 104 and 105 reminds us of. But they forgot about God. And what does forgetting about God do? Failure to remember God always, always leads to sin. Because forgetting about God sets you up to be totally in control of your life. And that is dangerous. That is dangerous. What you focus your mind on determines how you feel. And how you feel determines how you act. And if you're focused on yourself, you're not going to be acting like God. It's just that simple. There have been seasons in my life where for every day of the week, I've asked a man to specifically pray for me for a season of time. Times when I've been weak and felt vulnerable and I needed support from God. And so I ask other men to pray for me. Not only has that kept me aware of God's presence in my life, but it's kept me aware that these men were committed to me and they were praying for me. And it kept me in a position to pray for myself. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've been rescued from doom and despair and discouragement by asking people to pray for me specifically. 
Jesus set that example. I mean, when Jesus was here on this earth, do you know he spent more time praying to the Father than he did anything else? He woke up early in the morning praying. He prayed through the day, prayed at night. What an example for us to follow. I hope you're aware that, that, that we have a chance this week to truly show how thankful we are for God parting the Red Sea in our lives. For God destroying enemies who were chasing after us in our lives. And I pray you'll take advantage of that this Thanksgiving time. And then as we move through the holiday season, we have Christmas Day this year on Sunday. We have a great opportunity to bring our families out and join together in, in celebrating what Christmas is really all about. Don't be so wrapped up in the things of the world that we forget about the main thing, that we forget about God. We have an opportunity to make Him the priority this Thanksgiving and this Christmas. And I pray we won't fall into the trap of ingratitude like the Hebrew children did. Well, on we could go, but repent today of any ingratitude that you have in your life. Are you willing to just take a small moment today and say, God, would you just impress upon me any area of my life where I'm really not being grateful to you? And repent of that. Turn away from that. Turn back to God in that area. Category number two, then, is found in verses 14 to 18, and I've entitled this Endless Cravings, right out of Scripture. Verse 14 says, They had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but sent them wasting disease among them. So what's going on here? Well, there was a craving. The, the psalmist says a wanton craving in the heart of God's people. And the craving for the things of the flesh drew them away from keeping their focus on God. See, when we focus on the cravings of our heart, we're drawn away from focusing on God and simply trusting Him to provide what we need. Refusing to submit to God puts the focus clearly on ourselves. And again, that is a formula for disaster. Israel complained about God's leaders that he gave them. Things were better off back in Egypt. You know, why would you lead us out here into the desert grumbling about the leaders? They grumbled about the, the water that God provided for them. And so God provided water. They grumbled about the manna. Manna, manna, manna. Every day all we have is manna. So God gave them meat to eat. Grumbling was a symbol of the endless cravings that they had that gave them a spirit of entitlement, maybe. Maybe a spirit of self-centeredness. And those kinds of attitudes were drawing them away from God. And so, because they failed to remember the goodness of God, they fell under God's discipline. And the psalmist remembered an incident that's recorded for us in Numbers chapter 16. Look at, look at verse 16 of Psalm 106. When men in the camp were jealous of Moses, the leadership that God had provided, when the men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. Fire also broke out in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. So God's judgment, punishment, had to fall upon rebellious people because of their wickedness, because of their rebellion against God. God will always supply every need that we have, including leadership, for us to know Him and to serve Him. He supplies what we need. But when you forget, when I forget the resources that God has provided, we put ourselves in danger of discipline and even judgment. Korah and 250 of his followers became jealous of God's leaders and they fell under God's discipline. 
And then it was too late for them to say, I'm sorry. There comes a time in life where it's too late to repent. God's Spirit, the Bible says in Genesis, will not always strive with man. And so when we feel God calling us away from our wanton cravings, we need to turn back to Him and repent. This past week, Kyle and I represented our church at the South Carolina Baptist Convention. We adopted a report there on sexual abuse from a sexual abuse task force. Does it surprise you that churches have to be on guard against sexual predators? Does it surprise you that we must take a stand to defend unborn and young children? Does it surprise you that we must be proactive in supporting women who have been abused? Our church, and we're going to look at our bylaws a little bit later today if you want to stick, stick around for that after our service here but we're responsible for taking care of our church family. That's a part of being a, a church. That's a part of being a family. It's, it's time for us to stand up and speak out for those who are less fortunate than we are, who are young children, who are abused people. We need to stand up on the standards that God has given us in His Word. See, when God's standard is clear, then we must not fall into the trap of Korah and his supporters. Anytime that culture and popular opinion are contrary to God's clear instructions, God's clear word, we must stand firm on the standard of God's word. Define things like homosexual marriage and gender alteration and fighting for the dignity of all human life are platforms that we need to stand on as the body of Christ, that we need to be firm on when it comes to being called a Christian, called a child of God. So how can you stand firm when it's tough in our culture to do that? Are, are you aware that there are wanton cravings that are pulling you away from God's standard in life. Things that are unhealthy. Things that occupy your mind that you're so focused on that you can't focus on walking with God. That's a dangerous place to be and the psalmist takes us there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 13 and 14, the Bible says, Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. And then here's the kicker. Let all that you do be done in love. See, sometimes saying I love you means taking a tough stand. Not going along with the flow. But doing it in the right way. Doing it in the way that Jesus did. So the psalmist encourages us to repent of wanton cravings, endless cravings that would draw us away from God. Are you willing today to take time and repent? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you any craving that is stronger than your walk with God that might be distracting you from your relationship with God, that might be taking you away from your walk with God. Remember, we sin when we fall into trap category number three of forgetting God, of forgetting God. Uh, verses 19 through 23 remind us that forgetting God can be blatant or it can be subtle. But either way, forgetting God is sin. That's why I've always encouraged a lifestyle of waking up in the morning and focusing first of all on God before looking at social media or looking at the news of our day. Focus first on Him. Look at verse 19. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God. In other words, they exchanged their glory for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, 
who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him and turned away his wrath from destroying them? Now, this event that the psalmist brings to mind, if you look at it in context, it, if, it, if it wasn't so serious, I mean, it literally would be hilarious. In Exodus chapter 30, 32, while Moses was up on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, the children of Israel became impatient. They couldn't wait for him to come back down with a word from God. And so they created an image, a calf, out of all their gold and began to worship that molten image. Moses confronted Aaron and the leadership and he said, what were y'all thinking about? And they said, well, we just took all this gold and we threw it out in the river and poof, out popped this calf. Now, that would be hilarious if it wasn't so serious. But the heart of God was so broken for his people that he determined to destroy them. And so Moses turned to God and interceded for his people. And he said, God, don't you know that if you destroy all your people, the nations are going to they're, they're gonna look at you like a harsh God. They're not going to believe that you're the loving God that you are. And so Moses turned away the wrath of God by interceding for his people. I love what Timothy Keller says about this. Timothy Keller says that Moses turned away God's wrath by interceding for his people. But never forget that Jesus took the full cup of God's wrath on behalf of you and me to absorb God's wrath that should be coming our way, and Jesus took it all on himself. John chapter 3, verse 36, the Bible says, Whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You don't want the wrath of God to be on you. And it can be avoided today because Jesus has already paid the full price. He's taken the full cup of God's wrath for your sin. And if you will simply be sorry and admit your sin and confess your sin and turn away from your sin and turn to God through Jesus, you don't have to pay the wrath of God. But if you don't, the wrath of God remains on you. What an invitation to come to Jesus and trust Him today to forgive you of your sin. Forgetting God has serious consequences. In Romans chapter 1, verses 22 to 24, the Bible says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things, golden calves, that kind of thing. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Clear message from God. Did Israel repent and say, I'm sorry I was wrong? No. Not in the wilderness. Not in the promised land. Not in Jerusalem during the day of Jesus? Not today. In Revelation chapter 3, chapters 1 through 3, we have a description of the seven churches in Asia. And the Bible clearly says that these seven churches in Asia were called to remember and repent. Remember and repent. And that's what God is calling you and me to do today as well. Remember what God has done. Don't forget what God has done. And repent. Turn back to God. See, God is doing a great work in our world today. Are you aware of that? 
God is on the move in our world today. The gospel is more relevant and more needed today than the Ten Commandments were in their, their generation. You and I have an opportunity to not complain about the problems of the world, but rather take the solution, the gospel, to the world around us. The gospel is the hope of the world. So let's go. Let's focus on the solution rather than drowning in the problem that's going on in our world today. There's a lot of rebellion in this world today. But we don't have to be a part of celebrating that. We have the solution in the gospel. So are you willing to join me today in repenting for forgetting God when it comes to facing the challenges and the problems of this world? Repent. Share the gospel rather than drowning in the bad news of this world. Fourthly, we remember sin when we fall into the trap of disobeying God. Not just forgetting about God, but blatantly disobeying Him. We see that in verses 24 to 27. Then they despised the pleasant land, having no faith in His promise. They murmured in their tents. They did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore He raised His hand and swore to them that He would make them fall in the wilderness and would make their offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the lands. Be careful who you listen to today. There were 12 spies that were sent into the promised land in the first year of their journey from Egypt to the promised land. Ten of the spies said, we can't do it. Giants in the land. We can't take the land. And because people listened to those ten witnesses, those ten spies, they lost the privilege of entering the promised land. Only two, Joshua and Caleb, were faithful to say, we can do it. Let's follow God's promise. Let's go after trusting in God. Only those two men were allowed to enter into the promised land. All the other million people of Israel, Hebrew children of that generation, died and were not privileged to enter the promised land. Many voices are calling out in our world today. Voices of fear. Voices of pleasure. Voices of power. Voices of past failures. Many voices are calling out to us today. The door to the promised land is open to you today and every person on planet earth through Jesus. Have you trusted him to forgive you of your sins? Have you trusted him to give you the promised land, to give you eternal life? If you have, his clear command is for us to be his witnesses, to be on mission with him you may have times in your life where you've listened to the wrong voices you may have listened to the wrong witness voices in your life but it's not too late today to confess that and turn away from that and let God take that experience that may have been really negative in your life and turn it into something that is a doorway for someone else coming to know Jesus and walk with Him. That is the value of your personal witness. That is the value of your personal testimony. So don't forget about what God has done for you. You are here on this earth to stand up for Jesus. And the voice of Jesus is calling you out of and away from the voices of this world that want you to drown in your fear and drown in your past and drown in your sorrow. Confess the fears and failures and follow His voice and say, God, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I'm ready to follow Your voice. Are you willing today to repent of disobeying God, turning away from Him? Very quickly then, category number five is idolatry. Remember, we sin when we fall into the trap of idolatry. Verses 28 to 31. 
They yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. They ate sacrifices offered to the dead. They provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds. And a plague broke out among them. Then Phinehas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stayed. And that was counted to him as righteousness from generation to generation forever. Idolatry. Putting anything above and over God is dangerous. It's disastrous, actually. Today, we have many idols. What are we yoking ourselves to today by way of idolatry? Maybe pleasure, comfort. Maybe possessions, you know, craving just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Maybe power. Allowing influences of people or influences of popular opinion to sway us away from the clear path of knowing and obeying God. In Numbers chapter 25, in the middle of the plague caused by idolatrous, immoral actions of the people of God, Phinehas took a a radical stand. He destroyed two of Israel's most blatant offenders and consequently preserved his family and preserved generations in Israel after him. See, it's always right to stand up for what is right. In verse 32 and 33, they angered him at the waters of Meribah. That's a sign of impatience. It went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with his lips. Now, this is sad. Moses lost his privilege to enter into the promised land because he took the place of God and took what God said further than God said it, and consequently, he was not allowed to go into the promised land. How sad. See, it's critical to let God do His work in His way rather than you and I pretending to be God and addressing evil on our own. When God gives clear instructions, we need to obey that, but we need to be very careful not to overextend what we feel, what we think, over what God says. See, the worst form of idolatry in me is for me to play God. To take the place of God in my life. So would you join with me today in repenting from all forms of idolatry. And we could spend forever talking about this. But do whatever it takes to make sure that God is in first place. In your priorities, in your life, in your witness. In your family, in your neighborhood. Do whatever it takes to put God first. Remember, we sin also, number six, when we abandon our identity. Abandon our identity. We see that in verses 34 to 39. Entering into the promised land, they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. And they became unclean by their acts and played the whore in their deeds. Now there's so much we could say about this in the context of our world today. Sacrificing our children for the benefit of our own pleasure our own sakes, is nothing new. Are we willing to repent of that? This idea of becoming, playing the whore in the land, again, is just a symbol of abandoning God and turning to anything else that would replace Him in our lives. That's a dangerous thing since covid It's so sad to me, and I'm not just talking about our church, I'm talking about across our Christian culture. 
You know, the last people to return to church have been children and families with children. What are we sacrificing our children to in our culture today? Comfort? Convenience? The pleasure of parenthood and that sort of thing. So after meticulously entering the promised land under God's guidance, Israel abandoned their identity. See, when you become a believer in Jesus, God gives you a new identity. 2 Corinthians 5.17 said, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. So what does that look like in our world today? Does it look like, well, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I can do what I want to do after I get saved because I'm living under grace. No. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ... God gives you a new nature. He gives you something new to want. And that's putting Him first. That's craving Him above everything else. So repent today with me of abandoning your identity in Christ. And put Him first at Thanksgiving and through the holiday season. And every day of our life in the next year and years to come. And that leads me back to where we began this morning. Category number seven. We fall into the trap of sin when we fail to admit that we've rebelled against God. Category number seven is rebellion against God. Verse 40 says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against His people, and He abhorred His heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nations, and those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their power. Many times He delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low through their iniquity. See, God had to use foreign authorities, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, to bring justice to His people. In verse 44, Nevertheless, He looked upon their distresses when He heard their cry, for their sake, he remembered his covenant. He relented according to, his, to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. So remember this. God is a covenant-keeping God. He sealed his covenant with you and me today through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I trust that you know Him. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession requires remembering. So today, remember our sin. Next week, we're going to pick up with number two, which is repent and rejoice in God's forgiveness. Repent and rejoice in God's forgiveness. That is is the key to thanksgiving. So today, I want us to remember that only a full confession of our sin, a full confession of our sin, represents a repentant heart that we have toward God. There's no need to hide sin from God. He already knows about it. There's no need to hide sin from those that we've sinned against. We need to confess it and repent and turn away from it with them. And so remember three things as I prepare our hearts to pray right now. Admit that you're sinful by nature. Secondly, believe that God is a redeeming God. And thirdly, repent and then sing His praises. Would you bow with me in prayer? God, today, we ask you to search our hearts. We ask you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to humble us before you. God, may we have a humble spirit. God, may we confess our need of repenting from ingratitude and the endless cravings of our life and forgetting you and disobeying you. 
the idolatry that we put things over you. God, how I pray that you will forgive us for not remembering our identity in you. God, help us to remember that it's important for us that if we were truly put on trial today for being a Christian, there would be enough evidence that would convict us of our identity in you. So God, forgive us for our rebellion against you. And I pray that as we move through this week of Thanksgiving, that we'll have that kind of attitude where our heart will be confessional, and that we'll repent of our sin and turn away from it and turn all of our lives over to you. And then, God, I pray that in our spirit there will be a spirit of rejoicing. And we join now in celebrating you and worshiping you with all of our heart and all of our life. In Jesus' name we worship.